All right, I got need a clock. I'm gonna get that started. Be, for those of you who were, uh, unless Dr. Ken, I got. I was right up here. Right up here. Up I was here. asked to stay here and monitor you this morning, <laughs> and remind you that you have a form up there for them to fill out for pesticide training. Well, that's my job. That because that way I can turn my travel in. Forgot about it. If you don't know Dr. Mark McCann, he is the assistant dean for extension, and uh, he gets phone calls a lot from me, and usually I'm in, have a problem, and he's. I need his help. So as he reminded me, his camp hand, young, camp hand, one of the young guns, right? He, uh, one of the young guns, and he told me ten times, and he should have, because I forgot. Best side credit stuff is up here, okay? Um, I'm proud you all are here this morning, because a lot of people, when they saw that it's the first one in the morning and everything like that, they get with Bob, they would they would be afraid that Bob might, how you doing, Craig? Doing all right. How are you? Good to see you. Um, be afraid that uh, he would talk too much and so he wouldn't finish up on time and you'd be late for the next one. But the, the good news for you is that I have a, uh, I teach class at 9.05 and so and this gets over about 8.50 and so whether I want to stay and talk to you all there or not. But I will be back and I look to talk to you all as we go forward. But uh, today's talk, the first session that we're having is on uh, disease nematode management update on cotton as we go through. That's critically important, and I'm going to show you why. I'm going to show you why. Prosco laughs at me. You know Prosco, he's our weed scientist for peanuts, and every time I talk about climate, he's going to laugh at me. He's going to laugh and he's going to say, I've heard that. It doesn't make any sense. It's voodoo. All right? Or Bob's is right as often as he is wrong. Okay? But I'm going to show you some information today of why we have to pay attention to it. And at some point, I keep watching the door, our new cotton nematologist, Jimmy, I am... Extension, I'm, I'm really a plant pathologist, but I've done the best I could for 20 years to be a plant pathologist, I mean, a nematologist. But we have Dr. Intiaz Chaldori, and uh, he's not from around these parts, but he's a good guy, all right? He's a good guy, and uh, he just started in August, so I asked him to come in here and introduce himself, and he assured me he would be here, and so I'm sure at some point he will. If you got questions, don't hesitate to ask me, but absolutely, absolutely, if you grow cotton in Georgia, in 2023, I can promise you that the threat from nematodes is real and very real even at this moment. And the threat from this disease, areola mildew. Areola mildew is everything that I thought target spot would be and more. Target spot is still a threat, but areola mildew is something, Tim, that used to stay home in southeast Georgia and would come in late and would rarely venture across I-75. In 2022, it was identified for the first time in Arkansas, first time in Tennessee, and it's been found in Mississippi. And anybody with cotton knows nothing matters until they find it in Mississippi. So they found it now. So we're going to talk about it. I don't care if you follow me or not on Twitter. I don't. Okay? But if you do, I promise you, no Philippines, no graveyards, no cemeteries, no Bob stories. It's only about the kind of diseases and nematodes I'm finding on corn, cotton, soybeans, people. It's my ability, my effort to get out of time and information in addition to what we do. Come on in the house, let's yes, see it. In addition to using our county delivery system, I message them first, let them know that I put it on the internet. Okay? Here's what I need you to know. Here's what I need you to know. BJ, you've been here 20 minutes. There's no excuse. Come on in now. My man, I'm sorry. Come on in the house. I'm here disrupting my train of thought. My man. Right, come on in the house. I just got started. Scott, come over here. You don't mind if I ate breakfast while you get started? No, no, no. <laughs> Scott Brown, you do whatever you want to. I'm just up here trying to finish. Well, just your presence intimidates me. All right, so here's what I need you to do as we go through. Whether you believe in climate or La Nina or not, it doesn't matter to me. What you need to know is what the potential is. Prepare for the worst or hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Opportunities for nematode control. One of the things I'm going to talk about, come on in the house, Tony, you keep coming, just come on. Don't Sit up here next to Scott Brown, come on in the house. All right? He's not up there next to you. I'm going to talk about opportunities. And in my world, whether it's peanuts or cotton or corn or soybeans, you get one opportunity to do some things right. And if you miss that opportunity, you sit on the sidelines and watch the game go on without you. Okay, so we're going to talk about that. A little bit about you, Sarah and Will. Tim, Tony. If you say well, it doesn't matter to guys like you, it doesn't matter anywhere in the state because southeast Georgia and into southwest Georgia, it can be a major problem. Target spot, arrow, no do. And you see that line up there that says cotton leaf world dwarf virus? 
I got that's about the only thing I'm going to say about it. I'm going to tell you that we have it, and we don't really need to worry about it. Okay? A blank slide. After 23 years, Dr. McCann, I finally figured out what these talks are. I've been tracking my brain. Do they matter? I talk to growers for 30 minutes. They come in, they want to get a sandwich, they want to get fed, they want to get pesticide credits. By the way, if you need pesticide credits, the form's up here. Would they come if they didn't get a free sandwich and pesticide credits? Okay? And what can I really tell to growers in 30 minutes? Or today, 40 minutes? That means anything. And this is blank slides it. Every time my little girl went back to school in Atlanta, or in Atlanta, it was Georgia Tech, every time, the last thing I would say to her was, check the oil. Check the oil. Now, check the oil means make sure that the car's got oil in it, right? But it's so much more than that. If you're a father, it's so much more than that, isn't it? Check the oil means look both ways when you cross the street. Check the oil means be careful who you're friends with, right? It's a way a father says you be careful. Last night when Rick Roth, our new grain specialist, was leaving the meeting in, in the, where were we, Cockpit. What's the last thing you say to a guy who's new to Georgia and he's going to drive through the dark, through the woods, from one place to another? Watch for deer. That's exactly what we say. This talk is a check the all, watch for deer. And watch for deer is so much more than, hey, they're out there, it's like, be careful, brother. Okay? So that's what this talk is. I may not see some of you all until this time next year. This is what I want you to know in everything else that goes with it. And that everything else goes with it comes through extension, through your extension agency. I'm going to start off with this slide. I'm going to start off with this slide not because it's necessarily the heart of what I'm going to talk about. It's not. But this is, a, this is the get it out of the way. The get it out of the way. Bull rots last year for early planted cotton, Jimmy, could be devastating. In some fields, we had Mark Davis says, do not bring me any reports back for the Cotton Commission unless you've looked at Bull Run. The simple truth is this. Friend, I have to, I'm just being honest, right? Unless you have bacterial bull rot that we can solve with a fungus, with a uh, resistant variety, unless you have bacterial bull rot that we can solve 100% Scotty with a resistant variety, all these other ones I cannot touch. I can't spray anything. I cannot control bull rots. And when you look at this one, this is the most common one we've got, the Floridian bull rot. This is out of an areola mildew study in Bullock County yesterday, last year. I can't. Why? The fungicides we use for that fungus, the Floridian, or last year the Floridian theobromate, are extremely effective in the, in, in the laboratory. But the problem is we cannot get the coverage. We cannot get the fungicide through the canopy. Even if we can, that bowl is three-dimensional. If we cover the top, we can't cover the bottom very well. We just can't control it now. And so if you're looking for something new and different from Bob, we're going to tell you the same thing. Try to increase airflow. Try to increase airflow. Try to reduce leaf wetness periods. Camp Hand has done studies on skip row cotton and wide row cotton. And guess what he finds? In some situations, you can reduce bull rot, Tony, a tiny bit by increasing that airflow. You can. But increasing that airflow with skip row or wide row cotton, you lose yield simply by doing it, which is more than the benefit of the rotted bulls. But we have no answers. If you came in here expecting or hoping or praying that Bob had some new answer for bull rot, we don't. But I just want to get it out of the way. Bull rot's extremely difficult. The good news last year is if you planted early, this is the bad part, bull rot was devastating. But we reached a point in the season where bull rot basically went away. Basically went away. It's all about timing. Okay? Any questions on that? A lot of times just uh, physical hard lock is confused with bull rot. Exactly. And it gets blamed this bull rot. There is, when you're... When, when your bowl cracks and opens, but it doesn't fluff, there's a lot of things. That could be stem bugs. That could be physiological bowl rot. It could be the conditions at time of bowl opening. That is not bowl rot. That is tight lock, that's hard lock, whatever you call it. That's not what we're talking about. And how you control that, certainly, I just won't do it. That's why I like him to sit in front. What, what causes, I'm going to be confusing, I'm making a mistake myself. What Everybody causes does. the top? Right? The tight lock can be caused by several components. I know you say, right? The biggest one, so I'll say there is a black box there that we don't know exactly all the reasons. 
But I will say that environmental conditions, so when that bowl opens and cracks, the right environmental conditions are necessary for that lint to fluff in the spring. Okay? So the wrong environmental conditions can have something to do with it as well. When you see that pink color that we used to say was fusarium hard rock, I believe it's just incidental. It is fusarium, it is there, it's incidental to what, the, I don't believe it's causing it. They said, what's well, gluing the fiber together? I don't believe that. Okay? But the big thing is, outside of insects, and I'm not saying fungi can't be involved, but outside it's more of environmental conditions is open and environmental factors other than a disease. A lot of people think you know, that bowl starts cracking and you get rain and it falls in there and that, that has something to do with that. It can, yeah, it does. Because in order for that lint to fluff, for that bowl to open like popcorn, you have to have the right humidity, the right environmental conditions. And so you might also introduce fungi from the outside <coughs> and the inside. And new lint is like Got the candy to a fungus. Okay? You're exactly right. Scott, I would give you all my time. I would sit, I would sit at your feet and listen if you would talk. A bowl opens through dehydration. Okay. So as it dehydrates, then that those carpels shrink. It causes a physical opening by a hinge at the bottom of that bowl. Once, if it gets rehydrated early in that process, it stops, will dry out, and will continue to open. If it gets rehydrated after it completely dries out again, it stops and it won't open. So you got one chance? You got two one chances. Okay. okay. Well, my question is, we've been in cotton all my life. We ain't home. Well, maybe I just want to watch it. It just didn't seem like we had these problems years ago. You know, if we got rain, we may got it. We also have 555. I'm telling everybody that's a miracle. Is that something that we've seen that transpired in the last 10 years or 15 years? I would say, and I'm going to break down, I'm going to break it off there, but I would say that it is, it is something we're becoming, we have become increasingly aware of since Jim Marois in about 2005 said he solved the problem with We've been become more aware, and since that didn't happen, anyway. All right, so I'm gonna hold it there. But uh, if anybody knows Scott Brown, he's he's a wealth of information that he will freely share. Okay, freely. All right, let's talk about La Nina real quick. I didn't get laughed at this. La Nina, we're in a three-peat La Nina. A La Nina is characterized by warmer and oftentimes drier winters. We got about seven days of rain, and nobody believes me, right? We are the third year. The conditions are this. Okay? And I know all about the fact that freeze we had in Athens and in South Georgia over Christmas. And I know a couple weeks ago or last weekend it was freezing temperatures. I know in Lumber City at 7.30 yesterday morning on the way to Scriven County, I watched them scrape ice off the cars at the, at the uh, quick stop. Right? I know that. We're not talking about weather. We're talking about the conditions that in the southeast are generally warmer and drier. And we are in a third year. And here's the reason why it's so important. Whether you believe me or not, prepare for the worst, hope for the best. Because on January the 14th of 2022 in Tiff County, Georgia, and this picture on the left was in Mitchell County, Georgia, we had blooming cotton. And we had all that stalks that were regrowing. Well, that's 2022, Bob. I know that was last year. That didn't this year. We don't have blooming cotton in Mitchell County. We do not have regrowth on cotton. But we do have a lot of cotton that's left in the field. It's not been mowed. And it takes under the right conditions when soil temperatures get above 65 degrees, it takes about three weeks for an egg of a southern root knot nematode to find a host to infect and to reproduce and start producing eggs again. Okay? Three weeks. So when you think about when you picked cotton last year, when you mowed the stocks, how long was it until that Christmas freeze? Did you have time for buildup? And there's a soils increase. Right? Well, Bob, we've had all that cold weather. We've had those freezes. Okay? You can't read this very well, but I'm going to read it for you. This is what I got yesterday. This is from John Offenberg. He is a uh, consultant in mid-Georgia, and he sent this to me. And this sample was taken on January the 18th because the grower wanted to know what the nematodes were, Tony, and he said, we don't need to do it. The grower said, do it anyway. I'll read it for you. And this one sample, there's the root knot nematodes. Not root nine. When you come here, in this one sample, this is 100 cc of soil out of North Georgia. On January the 18th, when those nematodes will be sleeping, 4,536 reniforms per 100 cc of soil. 
1,854 reniform nematodes per 100 cc of soil in the other sample. Okay? So the point is, it is January the 18th. We're thinking, Bob's <coughs> crazy. Maybe he is. But the proof is, we still got active reniform nematodes out there. We still got in other samples, he had active root knot nematodes. And so the point is, the conditions we've had, despite some cold weather, the soils have been okay and will continue to be okay, most likely, that we need to be prepared. And the importance is you get one chance. You get one chance to fight it. So despite the fact that we've had those cold temperatures, and you can ignore me, you can say, well, I'm not worried because it's been cold. Has it been cold enough, long enough, in a year like this, coming off the third year of a, of a La Nina? Now, my wife's from the Philippines, and that's lemongrass. We've kicked that back. Her lemongrass is dead. At least it's dead to the soil surface. And I've had to knock the ice five times off my dog's water dish. I didn't have to do that at all last year. So I was hoping that meant that nematodes wouldn't be as big a problem. But that sample taken by John Offenberg on January the 18th shows that at least in central Georgia, around Cochrane, the nematodes are active, and we need to be prepared for them. Are those two fields continuous, or are they widely separated? They're not, well, they're same grower, they're, uh, they're not contiguous, but they are, but they're within proximity of each other. I didn't notice the state, if it had any state numbers, but it had lamps, it had uh, root horn, it had uh, root knot. did not have stain, it had root knot, it had lamps, it had so the thing on must be there is, is that, that, that they better be prepared. Now that's one situation. But if the nematodes are active there, it should give us at least cause to think, what do I need to do? Because the most important thing to remember about nematode management in cotton is the opportunity. If you are going to fight nematodes in cotton, everything you can possibly do, with the exception of a Band-Aid bite aid treatment at the fifth to seventh leaf stage is 17 ounces. Everything you can do is over, Craig, when you drive away from the field. When you have covered that furrow, you've made your decision on planting date, you've made your decision on what variety you're going to plant, you've made your decision on what nematicides you're going to use or not use. Okay? Every decision you can make. Can you imagine? How many months do you grow cotton? Five months till you harvest? Right? For the next five months, everything you did on that day or didn't do is the die is cast. Okay? So that's why we keep talking about it. We keep talking about nematodes because I don't want people to come back, farmers come back and say, what can I do now when there's nothing you can do? We keep talking about them because they're hard to see. If they were as big as stink bugs or glyphosate resistant pigweed, I wouldn't have to convince you. I wouldn't have to convince you that that's not sorry dirt, that is dirt that has nematodes in it, right? We got new varieties or newer varieties. We've got the nematicides we're looking at. And for that reason, we keep talking to make sure that no one says, after we talk about checking the oil, that you've checked it, you know what's out there. Because you don't want to be this guy. I show this picture every time. Because this is the poster for what happens. And the picture on the right, the grower's not there. His, his uh, hired man was there. Hired help work was there. He would come out. This grower's in Bullock County. He likes 1646. Right, Bill? Bill, that's Bill's not be. Strike me down if I'm lying, Bill. Right? They said he liked 1646. He went out in that field because of economic reasons. He went out there with three and a half pounds of, at the time it was Timmy, Ag Logic. And we got this call at the end of the year, right? We went out visiting. The cotton was eaten up with root knot nematodes. Eaten up across the field. And the sad thing was there was nothing we could tell him to do because everything that could have been done ended when he closed the furrow. The variety he planted, what he put out, the rate he put. And so everything we do at extensions, we want to make sure whatever you do, you're not surprised if this happens. Because what resistant varieties will do for you is on the right. What susceptible varieties is on the left with root knot nematodes. Root knot nematodes infest at least 70% of our cotton fields. Whether they are in your area, up around uh, in northeast Georgia, or whether they're in your area, in southwest Georgia, root knot nematodes. The problem is when you get up to you, you got just as many reniform nematodes. But we got an answer. At least we got an answer, a part of an answer. Okay? So what we can get with root knot nematodes is two things. I can promise you, you plant a root knot nematode resistant variety, you drop your nematode populations down like you planted peanuts, and you don't have that damage. Well, cotton growers don't grow cotton for roots. You don't grow it for leaves, you grow it for lint. 
And that's the thing we have to tell you is that the new varieties, if you're willing to give them a chance, the new varieties not only have resistance to root nine and sometimes run for nematodes, you do not need a nematocyte, but they also yield better. <coughs> they also yield better. If you ever go and listen to Camp Han talk, young gun, Camp Han, and he'll show you proudly his data from last year, OBT trials. And you'll see that Dollar General Dynagro variety up there at the top, $37.99 up there at the top. And you'll see those varieties from Delta Pine and from Stoneville up there at the top and maybe from Next Gen. And you'll look way down at the bottom of his list and you'll see two phytogen varieties with root knot resistance. Because everybody's looking away from those, right? They're looking away. So I don't, why would I plant those? Two things to remind yourself about. The first thing is the difference in lint yield between the top and the bottom looks big on a graph, but if you actually do the math, it's not a whole lot of difference between the top and the bottom. It skews your perception. The second thing is those trials were conducted in non nematode fields. Those resistant varieties, if you put them where they belong, they're going to make good cotton. I'll show you. Just think about it. Okay? Think about it. In your area, with the reniform nematode, the root knot nematode. In your area with the root knot, Jimmy. Tim, with the root knot nematode, we've got now, but you've got sting nematode too. We'll talk about that. But with the root knot, the reniform varies like 2141. 443, 332, the ones from phytogen and the one from delta Five. what we have there is the opportunity to grow cotton in the presence of root knot and reniform nematodes and still make yield, okay? Still make yield. If you look at the picture on the far left, that picture I took, that's out of the Panhandle of Florida, but that's a reniform field. That's 1646 versus the phytogen reniform resistant variety, okay? That's how they perform without an imaginacy. One thing to note is we have near immunity to root knot nematode. You plant one of these varieties and you don't get any buildup or very little buildup or damage. <coughs> Reniform nematode, you probably get about a 60% reduction. It's not quite as good. But the things to consider. Okay. If you're not going to plant a resistant variety, and we've got a lot of resistant varieties out there, those three have both root knot and reniform. One's like 411 from phytogen and the others. One's from uh, other companies. We'll have primary root knot. Came in just, just after I passed the um, um. I got a question, Bob. Yeah. Before. So let me ask you, hang on a second. 21 and the uh, 443 reniform, you like it? Me? Okay. Oh, behind you. Pretty good variety? Pretty good variety. If you got, if you got reniform, it'll, it'll make you some cotton. There yes. you go. All right. <clears throat> Auntie Adam, I'm calling you in a minute, all right? Don't you run away. Yes, sir. Okay, these resistant varieties, do you still need to use these products? Because I thought I thought how we got here was when we lost Timmy, then we had seed treatments, and we all thought seed treatments were gonna do it. And I think over time they were slowly building up. So slow you just couldn't recognize it. You know your yields were going down, but you couldn't figure out why. Right. Am I on do they do we still need to use that? Okay. The question is, if I plant a 443 or a 2141 in a reniform environment, or if I plant a 411 in a root knot environment, do I still use, use, need to use the nematicide? And the answer is generally no. You do not need to. You do not need to. Now, I'll tell you this, that in a high reniform nematode population, out the roof, I know the resistance in these varieties is stronger for root knot than it is for reniform. Okay, so we might consider it, but in my opinion right now, certainly I would not use nematicide in a root knot environment with a root knot nematode resistance. The resistance is so good. In reniform, I wouldn't do it either, but I would recognize the reniform resistance isn't quite the same as it is in root knot. Okay? If you're going to plant 60, if you're that guy in Bullock County, and I understand, right? I don't care. I want, I want 1646. Okay? If you want that, then you better put out the right nematicide at the right rate. Okay? And three and a half pounds of ag logic is not the right rate to fight nematodes. Mike, it's just not, right? It's not. Not your head, yes, it's not the right rate. Okay? We need at least five to seven pounds. But I can't put out a granular bob. I don't have it. I'm not set up to do that anymore. We got vellum. The last thing the world I want you to do is think vellum is bulletproof. It is not bulletproof. But at the six and a half pounds rate, it is a product that performs well. But you put it in a very difficult situation to be what you talked about. 
Now, you mentioned seed treatments like Evicta and BioST and Copio Prime. <coughs> they are better than nothing, especially in a low environment. But they will hurt your feelings if that's all you're relying upon. If you've got high nematode populations and you're not going to go with a resistant variety and you're not going to go with Agologic or Telone or possibly the Vellum, they'll hurt your feelings. Seed treatments are just not enough, but they do do something. Okay? Questions from me on that? Um, I understand the dynamics of root knot when we come up with respect to root knot. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and you and, 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 and grow peanuts, and then you grow a root knot with a form of just a brine behind it. Mm -hmm. That's two years. That really one doesn't have the most. How does that affect the root Great question. All right. So the reniform peanut is not a host for reniform. Okay. It's not a host. A corn is not even. All right. But the thing is, if your question is peanut with a reniform resistant variety, how does it affect the, the, the uh, dynamics? Reniform varieties will only cut back, in my experience, cut back the populations by about 60%. So you will still have, you'll still, the populations will be down, but you won't eliminate them or get them as close. So it's excellent. It's excellent, and you will be on the right direction. But you can't assume after one year of peanuts, one year of a reniform resistant variety, that going in that third year with cotton, that you might not have some sort of run back problem. to back. Back to back. You would still need to consider, do I need a resistant variety or would I protect it? But the difference is you might not need to tell them. You might need that. <coughs> this never happened, Bob. I wish my mother was here to see me get questions. Oh, my. I, I was just curious. So how many years do you think, whether it's cotton, peanut, whatever, of a resistant variety to nematodes do you think to reduce your population enough that you get to a point where you cannot have to apply a product. Colbert County, Georgia, Craig Paraben, my poster child, we did excellent work there with Telone and Aglogic and Vellum because every year we had a nematode problem. Right. And then we started testing resistant varieties. And I'm not saying we can't still run tests there, but I don't go there anymore. Right. Because of the fact that when you continuously plant resistant varieties, your populations are going down to such that, not that you don't have to worry about it, this is root nut now, not that you don't have to worry, but that to get good, reliable data for a trial. So but the short answer is, you can't do it. The short answer is, if you plant resistant rise in rotation with peanuts for, I would say, three years, it's not that the populations won't come back up, but after that period of time, you are out of that intense danger zone. So you get three. Yep, I would say three years. That's my experience. It's yeah, three years I can ruin a good nematode field so the nematodes are so low. But they will bounce back. You plant a susceptible yeah, right. crop and they'll bounce. They don't go away, they just yeah. okay. Anyhow, do you want to sit down? You want to come up? I'm not going to introduce you to two of y'all. You want to come up and sit in the front? You're like heroes to me. You're like Sudeep, you want to sit up here? It's like your side. This is I'll introduce him in here in a minute, I'll too. But Entheize is the factory trained new cotton nematologist and this man, raise your hand, Sudi. He single-handedly crushed cotton leaf roll dwarf virus. He made the problem go away. So, Sudi, we are all indebted to your efforts on that. Okay? Um, just remember, Vellum and Vellum Total, we don't have Vellum Total out there anymore. Vellum Total had a bit of You use Vellum for nematode control. Just remember, you need to make something with it. This is from Colton County last year. We got trials. Our county agents, like Tony back there, do a lot of good work for us. This is Colton County, Packer Park, root knot nematodes. This is final root knot nematode counts. Green is where we have 443, 2141, Dynagro 3466, Pfizer 411. <coughs> That's the nematode counts, root knot versus 1646 with Aglogic, 1646 with Aglogic plus Viking. Okay? That's one thing we get. We knock those nematode populations down. You ask me how long? Three years of knocking populations down, it makes it really, really hard to get a good test to test because we knock those populations down. When you look at the root galling, the damage on the roots, and again, the yellow is 1646 with ag logic and with bidator with nothing, the green is those four resistant varieties. You've seen that before. So why show it to you? Why show it to growers on a check the oil thought? The reason is it's not a single grower cares about galls. <coughs> Now, a single grower cares about populations if they don't end up doing what? Increasing yield. 
Okay? And so here is what happened last year in Packer Park. It was a tough year, but the green bars are four resistant varieties of root knot. Two of them are resistant to root knot and liniform, and the yellow is 1646 with ag logic and ag logic plus vitamin. And so the take home message is not that the green bars are necessarily taller than the yellow bars. They don't have to be, do they? They have to be at least as good or close to as good. Why? Because the green bars do not require five and a half pounds of ag logic times six and a half dollars an acre to paint that. Okay? If your concern on using resistant varieties is because of yield, put them in the right situation. Camp Hands variety trial was not in the right situation for nematode resistant varieties. And look and compare what it would cost you to take your favorite variety, whatever it may be, up to that. Okay? Questions on that? Questions? Late season calling is reduced always on resistant varieties. Root knot nematode populations crash with resistant varieties. Reniform populations do are con at least 60% reduced. 60% reduced, but the growth is greatly increased. Yield with these newer varieties, and I'm not going to say it every time, but I didn't cherry pick that. That was the data we got with Jeremy and Packer Park. We got other data that showed the same. It's not always that cut and dry, I admit. Okay? But these varieties we're planting, now you owe it to yourself to think about it. What's the most important thing about a resistant variety right now? If you don't plant it, then you've made your decision. If you don't plant it, you've made your decision. And if you don't plant it in a field with the root knot or reniform or sting nematode, well, Tim's got sting nematodes in his area. Sting nematodes is as important as root knot nematodes. If you got sting nematodes, everything I said about 443, about 411, about 2141, goes out the window, right? We have no resistance to sting nematodes. And that's why it's important, Dr. Chowdhury, is to not only know you've got a nematode problem, not only know how many are out there, but what type. Because if you're going to deploy resistance in Berrien County, I'm sorry I missed that fish the other night. I thought it was really good here. Right? In Berrien County, you've got equal chance to sting nematodes. And these varieties don't work. Okay? Questions on that? Questions. Questions on nematodes? Hey Bob, one quick question. Uh, how would your choice of cover crop affect your, uh, you know, typical mild winter if they're overwintering nematodes? Excellent question. Excellent question. You should do this as a profession sometimes. Uh, Stephanie is our PDC. She's in charge of training H. You probably know her from Brooks County. A lot. She's been around as long as I have. She's aged more gracefully than I have. But she's been around. Okay. So her question is: It's an excellent question, especially in light of whether you believe me or not about my Nina. You have to pay attention to it because your cover crop can make a difference. We would never grow, we should never grow clovers or vetches down here as a cover crop. Why? Unless you choose a resistant variety, they're going to build up. The root knot's going to eat them like candy, especially in cooler or warmer weather. What about wheat? If you're growing wheat as a winter crop or a winter cover crop, in a cold year, and guys, you're going to suppress the nematodes because they're just not going to be doing the root knot, they're not going to be doing much. But in a year like this, or temperature tomorrow, mild, or could be mild, wheat is a host for root knot nematode. Okay? So your choice of cover crop, you grow cereal rye, right? or, or, or uh, rye, rye cover crop, that's not a host for these nematodes. It won't build up. But if you grow wheat in a warmer winter, you could build them up. So it does matter. We don't grow clovers and vetches primarily in my world because of the susceptibility of nematodes. So it does matter. And it matters more in a three-feet linea. No matter if I've knocked the ice off the dog's dish. You're supposed to be like right up here. I don't recognize you in the back of the room. All right, what's your question, sir? Oats. For oats. Oats is, what's the susceptibility of southern oats? Oats is a good crop, but I think it has some susceptibility to a southern root. I've not pulled any samples, but just observation following roots. Uh, and the next crop, when we had oats from cows, we got more nematodes. Okay. I, I thought maybe y'all had done the research. What I, and I'm sure it's there. We don't have a lot of oats growing rotation, so it's not on top of my head, but I'll find out. But I will say this, no matter, this is disclaimer, Dr. McCann. I can tell you what the University of Georgia finds, I can tell you what our recommendations are. 
but in your fields, not so much with varieties, not so much with this, but in some situations, yours might be a little different than what we do. But I'll get the oats. Oats is not common. I don't think oats is a great uh, host, but I think it is a somewhat host fruit. The cows love oats better than they do the yeah. rice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and I guess the question would be, is you growing beef or you growing cotton, which is more important? So that's the, that's the big question. What about the, um, I saw Auburn did a study on a while. So that must be true then, right? <laughs> 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 well, Auburn did that much What about the wild radish or currants or something? Great question. <laughs> Great question. Wild radish, turnips, okay? If all you are going to, if you are not going to use a GMO variety, if you're not going to use a resistant variety, if you're not going to use a nematicide like I talk about, and you believe in prayer, you can use radishes, or turnips, all of those, because there is there is truth to it. The glucosinolates that can come out of those, and you incorporate, but they have to be incorporated. You have to have a large population or large amount. So the bottom line is, in theory, and you have no other choice. They do suppress. They do offer nematicidal activity, but in terms of cotton production in Georgia, by themselves, it's a small bit of a big problem. Just, Small answer to I a big problem. I there in a lot of our fields around. What's that? The wild, the wild. Oh, the wild radish. Yeah. It's not. It's not going to hurt. It's not going to help. <laughs> the wild radish. If you're talking about the wild radish, yeah. it's not going to help. Okay, I thought you were talking about incorporating the selection of cover crop based yeah. upon. Okay. It's not. Wild radish will not build your population. Yes, sir. Rye grass. Rye grass. When I said cereal rye, I meant rye grass. Ryegrass, in my opinion, i got an opinion almost as many as he does, but his are well found. <laughs> my opinion, ryegrass is probably, that's my preference for a cover crop in kind. Okay, as far as, far as nematodes, as far as nematodes go. Bob, question. Yeah. Years ago. Uh-oh. Let me take University. time out. If you say years ago, you said, yeah. I'm going to be a disclaimer Look, on that. If you say this years ago, right? Years, years ago. ago. Uh-huh. Auburn University was working with a black oak that they were saying reduces nematode pressure. And they did a bunch of testing and then all of a sudden the thing just disappeared. It's the same theory, not same, it's the same fact. It is fact. There are things, the black oaks, you know that, yeah, they were working black oaks, there's been others as well. These, these tillage radishes, I'm not saying they don't have value. What I'm saying is the aspect, how much they contribute to a huge potential problem in cotton production in Georgia is a small portion. I'm not saying don't do it, but black oats and, and uh, brassica crops, it's not that they, it's, it is true, but curb your expectations, right? Have your expectations realistic on what it will do, okay? On what it will do. Other questions? Other questions? All right? Oh, one question. <laughs> Should, as growers, should we be more aggressive about testing for nematodes and uh, sending samples off? I mean, what I guess what I'm saying is, I think what most of us do is we see if we get caught and don't they don't get that high, then we start loading up plants and all the county agents. Let me let me give you an example. So the answer is it's up to you. But in order to have the best nematode plan going into January the 24th, whatever the day is. And in this season, you have to know two things. You have to know what type of nematodes you have, because you need to know if your resistant varieties will work or not, and you need to know what your populations are. And if you're just guessing, here's a perfect example. I get called to Washington County about 10 years ago. And in Washington County, it looked like nematodes and acted like nematodes, but it couldn't be nematodes. You know why? They convinced themselves it could not be nematodes. Why? Because they looked at the roots and there were no galls on the roots. For them, galls and nematodes were one and the same. But what was it? It was reniform nematodes. They had tremendous numbers. So in my opinion, and I don't, can't speak for him, he'll have a minute here in a little bit, is if you're not taking nematode samples, you're blind. You may be missing what it is. Some growers will say, that's just sorry dirt. I need to put more fertilizer on it. If I would irrigate and fertilize that better, it would grow better. Well, if the problem is nematodes, that's not true. So if we do not sample, the cost in sampling, is, the cost is about, uh, about $25 a sample. 
The cost in not sampling is being blind in terms of what you're going to do. Now, if you go out to that same field, the cotton's not growing, you carefully dig the plants up and they're covered with galls, you know what the problem is for the most part, right? You don't have to have a soil sample to tell you that. But soil sampling in the fall of the year at harvest or before the soils get too cold, or even this year now, is the best way that you're not blind. Okay? And like nobody, you know, farmers don't have anything else to do than pull them up those samples. <coughs> That's why I plug for consultants. John Offenberg and consultants like Scott, right? You may not have time, but your consultants can help you with that. You pull in your uh, nematode sample the same depth you pull in your soil sample? Now, if you're a reniform nematode, and again, he's factory trained, he'll tell you that a reniform nematode can go four feet, right? Root nine, seven, eight, don't. But yes, for me, pulling nematode samples, when you pull them, you want to pull them out of the root zone where you were before if you can, not between. You want to pull them in the root zone. You want the soil to be moist enough. If it's powder dry, don't waste your time. But I'm looking at six to eight inches to get that sample. And what I would do is when you pull the soil samples, if you pull them in the right place, split them. Half goes for one, half goes for the other. Because if you don't, you're blind. You might have a good idea, you may think that you're blind. Okay. All right. Any other questions on the toes? By the way, this never happened. <laughs> you just you just you just make him feel good that he came to the right place. He sees a nematode problem. When do you say, hey, I've got a real problem or a severe problem, and you tell them versus Great question. Great, 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 great question. If I have a combination of, and Chris Goodman, you know Chris, he's got that, he's at that point. If you've got poor growth that you're saying I am losing yield and you pull that nematode sample and you're getting, I would say if you're above at the proper time, three to 400, I would say I would start thinking about that. If you're above four or five hundred, you know you're until this is root nine. So and reniform and reniform nematodes are numbers would have to be a little bit higher than that. Okay, because reniform nematode for nematode, it takes about two and a half reniform nematodes to cause the trouble, in my opinion, that one root knot does. It causes one sting versus a hundred the others. So anyway, I interrupt you. Which three hundred is three so that would be where I would start thinking telling you. Where you've seen damage, you got three hundred. Because our, our threshold level, our economic threshold level for root knot nematode is 100. That's just a ballpark figure. If you tell me you got 60 or 70, I still think you need a nematocyte or resistant variety. But if you get up there above 300, I'm starting to say, Can you, are you willing to put out fellow? Okay. Chris Goodman, if y'all don't care about Chris, he's not here, he'd have an opinion worse than me and Scott, right? But he would tell you, he fumigates just about his whole farm now. And he makes cotton and makes product. Okay? Any other questions about nematodes? Yeah, kind of on those lines, but if you're in the 60 to 70 range, it's a good thing you're here. You see, this one and, you're you're a real and you're recommending, and you're I'm real curious about, you know, the cost of telum. You know, how much are you getting out of like a, a vellum or a Rite Aid or one of the okay. you're at like a lower? All right. right. So I would say that in a field that needs telum, a field that needs telum, a resistant variety. Let's say it makes equal to 1646 plus telum. Okay. If you don't use Telone on a 1646 and you use AgLogic, I would say that your yield potential could drop off two, 300 pounds of land. I think that's what Telone will provide over AgLogic. And Vellum may be, I said two, 300 pounds versus AgLogic. Vellum might be three, 400 pounds. What about Vidate? Vidate. Vidate. Vidate in my world is only used as a second uh, is, is after emergence, 15 to 17. And I will be honest with you, on root knot nematodes in Georgia, I rarely see a response. But where we have reniform nematodes, in combination, for whatever reason, Vidate seems to work better on reniform nematodes, and a combination of vellum plus Vidate does increase, can increase, can increase yield to make it profitable. But I can't give you that, I won't give you a yeah, I'm just curious because you do all the tests. You know, right. Vite like Vite eight is one of those that um, it's there. The, the nice thing about Vite eight is that if we don't have anything else, we don't have anything else, right? When that furrow's closed, the only thing we got is rectal mill or whatever it is from. Uh, we got two ones. There's two. We 
got Return XL, and we got Vidate. And we probably have Viking. If poor old Larry Warren was here, he would say, he raised a love, what about Viking? Okay, V-Y-K-I-N-G. We got that too. But these are for post purchase And I would say, A, don't bet the farm on them. B, a wing and a prayer. C, they're the only thing we have to offer if you feel like you need to do something. At the best, they're going to extend that protective window. Okay? Great Bob, questions. Bob, if you... <clears throat> Are not set up to tell them that you don't want to go to the trouble for that. What would you do? I'd buy a resistant variety. And I mean, if your counts are so high, you need to tell them. Would you just plant a resistant yeah. variety? Or would you add some? I plant a resistant variety. We're talking root not in your world. Pretty, pretty much. I got root. If you got rid of them, okay. If they were that high, I would plant the resistant variety, <laughs> and I would call Bob and I call MTIs and say we want to see what happens if we mix the resistant variety with vellum or agglutin. Because what I'll tell you, what Drew in the back, what I will tell you is, I believe I have seen with them, but the one thing my familiarity with is I know the resistance of the Reniform is not quite as good as the root nut. What's your experience? If you got a Reniform variety, you're in South Alabama, there are 20,000 Reniform nematodes, would you put 443 in there without an amatocyte? How's that for throwing the, an audible? <laughs> By the way, he works with Corteva. He is my contact when we talk about testing reniform resistant varieties. I probably would put something, Jimmy, just due to the fact, too, that reniform are so aggressive. There's more generations of those a year that's going to be produced. Uh, and I don't know if you've seen this, but if you have a field that you've got reniform and you've got root knot, go back three years later and see what you've got. You've got a field of reniform. You have no, they will literally knock the root knot totally out of the yeah. field. They, can, that's, they will move the root knots out. They are so they are so aggressive. So if you have extremely high levels, I wouldn't have an issue doing that. But the most of our root knot stuff, we have, they're, they're a two gene type resistance. Our rental forms are one gene resistance. So therefore, if you've got the extremely high levels, I wouldn't have an issue putting, putting some ag logic down. Okay. My class, y'all are going to sign, but this is great. We got, we got, Bill, we got the nematodes, all right? We got about five minutes left. I'm going to show you two things, and then I'm going to let, I'm going to introduce these two guys. So Deep, the virus slayer, and NTI is the future of cotton nematology. Bill Tyson in the back, this is his trial. This is from 2021. He did it in 2022. It's exactly the same. If you look, the non-treated is white. The tebiconazole, the cheap folicure, is kind of white. He's oxystrobe and nervous top and preaxial. We got a lot of other things we could talk about, but you have this is check the oil, watch for deer. Areola mildew is absolutely essential in 2023. And every single trial we have, Drew, that wasn't compromised by nematodes or by a fertility problem, we are making, doesn't matter if it's in Terrell County or in Bullock County, or Colquitt County, or in Brooks County, when you still work for a living, Stephanie, okay? When you were still a county agent, right. in the field, your trials show the same thing. We cannot ignore it. This disease, aerolip if it comes in within a month of defoliation, ignored, it's a harvest aid, a defoliant aid. If you're more than a month away, a single application, Tony, when it comes in, a mesoxystrobin or preaxor or mirivus top is going to make you at least 100 pounds of length. And the preaxor and the mirivus top are even better than the abound. And they're going to make you 200 to 300 pounds of length. And the reason why there's more white in the non-treated is because the leaves fell off. And when the leaves fall off, you're not making your top crop as much. And anybody who says, Tony, well, I'm worried about bull rot, I want those leaves to fall off, Again, we did not increase bull rot. We measured, didn't we? Stand up for me, okay? You don't have to stand up. We just say, we did it. We looked, right? There was no difference in bull rot. But how much yield did you make last year? Yes. This is Bill's trial last year, right? You can pick that non treated Seth McCallish has done the same thing. Jeremy Kickler's done the same thing. Stephanie did the same thing. And what we are seeing in terms of yield is that. We made 1,400 pounds of lint in the non-treated. Well, I don't need to use a fungicide, Bob. I made 1,400 pounds of lint. Well, good. But if you don't want 100 pounds more of lint, 
for a single fungicide application, then be good with it. But in some trials, we're making 200, 300 pounds. If you don't care about 100, 200 pounds in land, don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. But if you want to make that with a single fungicide application, be ready for it. How much okay? does it cost when you uh, put out that fungicide application? Great question. How much per acre? Okay, it's whatever your cost per acre is. If you're putting out these oxystrobe, it's probably about five or six dollars an acre. So you're gonna make three dollars. How much are you making off a hundred pounds of lint? Well, right now, not much. <laughs> it depends. On, so if a hundred pounds of lint is not worth a twenty-dollar application, don't do it. If two hundred pounds of lint is not worth a twenty-dollar investment, don't do it. And it's not just what you get; it's what you might get. That's exactly right. Okay. Bob, I got the economic slide too. I did not send that to you. I didn't send you all of them. But the economics, that's what everybody asked. The economics line up the same way as they're lined up up there. When I put I, I put 85 cent on the cotton, I took and subtracted the fungicide cost from each one. And the fungicides from left to right go from about $25 to five and a half, six dollars for the Did you put the application cost too? No, sir. Because all that is the same. Uh, everything else is the same other than the fungicide. We estimate about $5 an acre for estimated per, per application. When, when you say the timing would be? The timing would be in his trials and Jeremy's, tri Jeremy's trials in Culver County, they're usually looking at the third week of bloom. My recommendation is don't put it out for aerial ability until you know it's in the area. You know, if neighbor has it, extensions found it, then I would think about doing it. Does. What's that? Third week of bloom? Right when everybody else. Oh, that's right. The problem with that is you may have to leave it with the peanut flour. The question is, ask yourselves: If I can tell you 100 pounds of lint or 200 pounds of lint, then if it's not worth it, with you, look at the economics. But I can tell you that you consistently get it. I will going to be done here. I want to get. I promise this guy. This is stand up. NTI's Chowdhury, he is a real nematologist. He is going to be responsible for nematodes on cotton and peanut, I mean cotton and vegetables. All right? Give one minute on what your vision is for what you're going to do with your job. So, so I am uh, from a small country in um, South Asia called Bangladesh. I did my... Give your perception on what you've you got. One, you got 45 seconds. What are you going to do for these guys? They're glad you're here. What are you going to do for them? I'm here to serve, and I'm happy to be here. And uh, I don't, I'm not a replacement for Dr. Kimmerite. I'm here to add to that. Uh, my program will have uh, both a bit of the laboratory work in the biology of nematodes, as well as the um, extension-related work, including... Um, the host resistance, the copper, uh, uh, copper crops, and nematicides, and um, yeah, I don't know. So all the things that we wish, Mike, we wish we had more data on, cover crops, varieties, all the things that go beyond just me having a recommendation, he's going to be able to do it. Okay? He'll be back, he'll be here all day, he'll also be back at 2 o'clock, we'll have some time. Last thing, Sudeep, the virus killer. You've got 30 seconds to tell him how you did it. If he was in charge of nematodes, we wouldn't have nematodes left in the state. They can do it. <laughs> Thank you for all of your support for the last three, four years. Uh, the virus has not gone from Georgia. Virus is still here. In our last uh, experiment, we did in four different counties in OBT. Uh, Bullock County, Colquitt County, Cook County, and Bird County. And in 60 days after emergence, we have on an average 45 to 73 percent of plant tested positive for virus. And by 90 days, I'm going by county. Bullock County has 50 percent of plant. Cook County has 68 percent. Watt County 76 percent. And sorry, Watt County 97 percent. And Cook County is. 76 percent. So, on an average, there is 70 to 90 percent of the plant that we tested in five different varieties are carrying the virus. So, why we are not losing any cop, aid, or whatever is happening, something is not triggering. Once it triggered, the virus is there, it may cause the loss. So, virus is not gone from Georgia, it is across the river at this point, but it may cause 
loss if there is some trigger that we do not know at this point. So, thank you all for your support for this research and hope we will continue this part. Earlier the question was going on about, I'm taking one more minute. Door, door, you got, you got earlier, earlier, earlier question was going on about wild radish. So wild radish, being a Don't virus guy, me. I work on all the different viruses. Class. I'll you. be around later, okay? I'm leaving <laughs> within 30 seconds. <laughs> so, so wild radish, right? I work on vegetable, I work on peanut, I work on cotton all the crops so everyone is here on cotton i'm taking your time here but wild radish also carries virus that is transmitted by white fly and some of your neighbors who are doing vegetable production they are going to get harmed by that virus so it's not that it is going to impact cotton but it is going to impact vegetable Wild radish is also carrying. They're ready to come in on the next one. You got to finish, bud. Okay. <laughs>